from our childhood days. The story of David and Goliath. You may wonder, why did I even pick such a very elementary, very simple kind of a story to speak today? But you would know, you know, the Lord, you know, I wouldn't have gone there. I had no intention to go there. But this morning, I woke up with a dream in which I saw and heard someone coming and telling me in the dream that this part of David's life or this story of David's life changed the course of history for David. And it's important that I speak today. So I, I woke up and I went through the Bible. I tried to find out why would God give me a, a message that is so commonly known in the churches. But then God gave me something very, very profound, which I had never seen before. I want to start off by saying, I believe this is the groundbreaking moment, the watershed moment, if you will, that changed the life of David. Do you agree with me? In chapter 16, David received the anointing of the Holy Spirit. The oil, the horn of oil came upon him. In chapter 16. But if you were to carefully study, you would, you would absolutely be stuck by amazement that nothing is spoken about David's reaction to the anointing. In fact, not even a word did David speak in the whole event. Can you imagine an, 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 a mighty event is happening which is completely, you know, focused on this young man. But nothing about what he did or what he said after that is ever mentioned. I don't even think he, there's anything mentioned about what he spoke before that in chapter 16. Nothing. So it is much more a muted chapter, chapter 16. But then it is chapter 17 that brings David into the scene. With chapter 17, we can see the, the effect of the anointing. And I want to say today, chapter 16 was the anointing. Chapter 17 was the effect of the anointing. It shows what an anointing can do in somebody's life. How anointing will start to, you know, demonstrate itself through someone. That is spoken in chapter, you know, 17. Now I want you to know again two more things. Number one, if you look in 2 Samuel 21, you can go home and read. 2 Samuel 21, you know, killing giants became a common affair, kind of a family affair in the household of David. Everybody in the house of David could kill a giant. It became like the family hobby. The uncle will kill a giant, his nephew will kill a giant, the people around him will kill giants. So they became essentially a family of giant killers. But here is a man who blazed the trail for such a giant killing mission. It is this man who started it all and later it became so common. Let me tell you, any time God does something, initially in the beginning, it's going to be a battle. But once the battle is won, it will become so common. Come on. How many of you know today to get people saved in Edmonton? To get them baptized is not so easy. You know, it's such a huge hurdle. I've always said, you know, in India, in Africa, we, we flow with the stream. Over here, it was almost like we are flowing against the stream. But let me tell you something. Once this battle is won, then people getting saved will be left, right, and center. Can I get a witness here? Healing will become so norm. Deliverance will become so norm. Can somebody believe God even raising the dead? All miracles will become norm. But there should be a starting point. And how many of you believe some of you are seated here are the ones that is going to inaugurate that move of God? Can I get an amen in the house of the Lord? God has brought you to inaugurate that. This church is precious. The people of God that I'm seeing today, that I'm ministering to you to today, are very precious because you are the ones that God has appointed to commence this move. Yes. 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 Yes.
prophetic move. You know, if you go to Tijo's church, even the ushers, I think the security guy standing there will prophesy. It's become so norm. But God had to raise somebody to begin it with. And I believe we are in the days where giants are going to be killed so that our families will continue the tradition of killing giants. Can I get a shout of hallelujah in the house of the Lord? That's the way the kingdom works. Let me continue. How many of you know in the history of, of Israel, the most important event is the conquering of Jerusalem? Jerusalem and half Jerusalem becomes the identity of Israel for both for time and for eternity. Let me make this very clear. Jerusalem does not belong to the you and no. It belongs to God. It is a property of heaven. It's one real estate that nobody can take. It belongs to God. So I wanted to know even that happened after this battle. Do you know, if you go in home and read, it's something very strange. David, after killing Goliath, you know what he did? He cut the head of Goliath, took the head of Goliath, and went miles, miles he walked with the head. Can you imagine? He's walking with the head, miles on the street, and goes to Jerusalem and planted this head there. Why would he do that? He's announcing, today Goliath, tomorrow Jerusalem. Because Jerusalem was in the hands of greater giants, people who are, you know, who are heathen, people who are the, 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 the tribe of, of people that were against God. And David is making announcement, if God gave me a victory today, I'm taking the head and putting it on my future victory. Come on. How many of you are willing to say, my today's victory is connected to some future? No, no. Can I get a good witness in this house today how many of you want to believe every victory that God gives you today personally as a family and as a church as an individual is connected to tomorrow's greater victories if you believe that put your hands together give a Lord a shout of praise in the house so this battle defined future for David David became well known after that nobody knew him before that but after that they gave him a song they told King Saul had killed thousands and David has killed his ten thousands. David became friends with the king's son, Jonathan. Everything happened after this incident. So I want to call this the most important event in the life of David. But before I go into that battle, I want to touch today five battles that happened inside that battle. So today I want to call it Listen carefully, the stalemate broken. Why would I give such a title? Because the story is almost like a stalemate. It's like the, the grand game of chess. It's come to a point where it's checkmate. And, and, and both are looking who will make the first move. Israel and Philistines are now spread on both sides of, 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 of a valley. And both are wondering who will make the first move. 40 days they are waiting. And both of them are not making any move. One group is represented by Goliath. And he says, you know what? If there's anybody from your end, anybody, if he comes and wins over me, I will be willing to give my country or I will announce the defeat of my own country. Just one person is a representative conflict. Give me one person, if he can defeat me, it's as if he has defeated the whole nation. But Israel is not able to take this challenge. They are absolutely not able to face this Goliath. He's a huge, gigantic figure. You know, probably from all understanding, he's almost 10 feet tall. How many of you know even the metaphor that is so commonly known in the West came from David Goliath? He's a David, we say. He was like a Goliath, we say. It all came from the story. You know, how we can evaluate somebody based on, on different aspects of their, of their strength. Came from the story. It's a metaphor in the Western, you know, tradition today. But it all came from the story. How can a small David kill? You know, we have seen in politicians, among called this guy was a small David. But he knocked down the great, you know, Goliath. So it became a metaphor. But listen carefully, people of God. You know, Goliath is an is a, is a imposing figure. 
You know, his size is huge, almost 10 feet. He doesn't have to even jump to, to dunk the ball. He can stand flat foot and put the ball in the, in the net. That's how big this guy is. And then look at his armor. You know, he is fully surrounded, covered with brass. And then there's a soldier that goes ahead of him, you know, with a shield that covers his head to toe. This guy is an imposing figure, a huge figure. But God wanted this man's power to be brought forth in order to show that greater is the power of the God of Israel. Come on. You know, I want you to know this is God's way of setting things in motion. He's giving a narrative. He's giving a certain kind of contrast. You need to know that you know, this is the only story in the Bible that is so long when it comes to a battle. It's the longest battle narrative in the whole of the Bible. The longest. And then minute details are given as to how tall he is, how many days, how much many armors, how much was the weight of each armor. Everything in minute detail. But let me tell you, people of God, God was focusing on the bigness, on the impossible, you know, stature of this man in order to show when the victory comes, it will not be by might or by power, but by the spirit of the Lord. If somebody feels that the problem that you're facing, the challenge that you're facing looks big, I want you to know today, your God is bigger. Your God is greater. Can somebody shout a hallelujah in the house of the Lord? God has this way of showing you how big and insurmountable is your problem. You cannot overcome it on your own. But that's the way God does it. Your sickness might look big. Your children's problem might look big. Your situation might look big. But today, God is putting that big problem before you to show that there is a God who can bring down this giant. And his name is Joshua, the God of Israel. Can somebody shout a hallelujah to the God of Israel? He's able to do it. Now, how many of you believe the giant that is in your life is big? Looks big. Imposes so big. You feel like a small trickle of strength in front of this huge giant. But deep down, do you believe that your God is far above? He's greater. He's more powerful. He can bring down this giant by his power. Can I hear a voice of people that believe that God, he's a God who can move in Edmonton, in Canada. He's still on the throne. He's still alive. And he's a God of power and of glory. Can I get an amen in the house? So it was needed for David to come into this fray in order for the history of Israel and his own future destiny to be brought forth. I want to bring four points today. You know, brothers and sisters, listen carefully. This is a mother of all battles that's going to unleash your destiny. But before you reach there, you, you, are, you, you have to face few battles that might look smaller, like skirmishes. But if you don't overcome those battles, you know, you cannot face this big battle. And today I'm going to touch on five battles that you need to face. Number one, let's put it there, circumstantial hurdle. Now what does that mean? Of course David has to come to this place in order to start his journey as the king of Israel. But how many of you know that David is a shepherd and the battle is happening far away? And there's no way a shepherd boy can go and fight the battle. There's no entrance for him. This is not like a theater where you can buy tickets and go and watch. He cannot go there. And many times when God says something to us, we face a huge circumstance as to how it's going to happen. Because it does not make sense in circumstantial point of, from circumstantial point of view. Because how in the world that this can happen? How in the world that that miracle can happen? How in the world this building can come forth? A lot of questions will be asked because circumstantially it looks impossible. But I want you to know something today. When God has a plan, he will also create something called providence. That means you don't have to struggle. You know how we see life? 
We see life as all the good things that God has spoken on the other side. And on this side, we are standing looking at them. But between that, there's a huge ocean. That's how we see life and there's no bridge to go there. God has not provided us a bridge. Of course, there's a beautiful plan ahead. Of course, there are things that are going to happen in the other, on the other side. But there seems to be no bridge connecting your present situation to your future. But I want you to know, when God does things, he does not have to put, need to put a bridge. He can bring circumstances together. That what looked impossible yesterday will become possible today. He will bring the right people and the right arrangement at the right time in order to fulfill his plan over your life. Can I get a shout of hallelujah? in the house of Allah. How many of you believe God can bring the right things together to bring forth the destiny of your life? No, you didn't hear me. Can I get a witness here? That's the story of this man. What happened on that day? The Bible says David's father spoke to David and said, you need to take food to your brother. You can go home and read. Take food to your brothers. And because he came with this you know, lunch box. He happened to enter. It came, so happened as he came, Goliath is just walking to make his announcement. To make his threatens. And David just walked into that place at the right time when Goliath has made his entrance. Let me tell you, God brought, made his father send him to the army, to the battlefield. And God was creating the circumstance. And the timing was so correct. Not a minute late. He walked in the right time when Goliath is making his entrance. And I want to make a statement today. When God has spoken something over your life, don't you worry how it's going to happen. Because God will bring circumstances. Come on, how many of you believe he works in such a way all things will work together for good for those who love the Lord? If you believe that, can you shout a hallelujah in the house of the Lord? Whether it's a job, whether it's a salvation of your family members, whether it's the church growth, whether it's a mission move, whatever God has spoken over our lives, I proclaim today God will bring circumstances together for that to happen. If you believe all circumstances are in the hands of our God. Even things that look bad today, God is going to make it work for your good, for your destiny. If you can believe that, can you shout agreement, amen, in the house of the Lord. Don't you worry about circumstances. He will put it together. I want everybody to receive it. This is more instructive. Can you believe God can put the circumstances together? Come on. Can I get somebody to believe this? He will work behind the scene. Somebody will come and talk to you. Somebody will make your phone call. And then you meet with somebody else. And before you know, a big door has been opened. That's the way God is going to work. You don't have to worry about how in the world it's going to happen. Let me tell you, the God who created the universe, who put the stars in its place, he's a God who can arrange circumstances of your life. If you can believe that, can you give a Lord a glorious hallelujah in the house of a Lord? He can bring circumstances together. Let me ask you, is anybody in this place, I'm not going to, point at anybody but is anybody in this place who has got a promise from God that looks impossible from a circumstantial perspective oh, you didn't hear that you have got a promise from God but looks impossible from a perspective of circumstances. But can you believe today the Lord who worked in the life of Esther is working behind the scene upon your family. He is bringing the right contact, right people, right connection to make this happen. If you believe that, can you shout an agreement, hallelujah, in the house of the Lord. The first... Oh. You say, Pastor, the story is about David and Goliath. But I want to say, even to reach that point, you need God. 
Before you can come to Goliath, God has to create that. Now, can I say something? Can you believe? Sometimes when we come, God opens circumstance and then we see a monster. We say, you know what? Ooh, ooh, it is all wrong. Maybe the devil was planning and working behind the scene. But can you say today, even when I see a monster, I'm going to believe there's going to be a victory. Come on. God has a plan. Oh, you didn't hear that. Is anybody that believes, yes, God, I prayed, I fasted, but what I see today after all this is a monster standing and threatening my life. Can you believe if God led you to that, he will also give you the victory over that and bring a destiny out of that. Even the problem of your life is a connecting point to your destiny. Amen. That's point number one. Let me go ahead. Number two, I don't have time to explain. I don't preach this way, but today I'm going to give more instruction. Hurdle of ego or self. What do I mean by that? Listen closely. When he came to the battle, can we read 1 Samuel 17 and verse number 28? 1 Samuel 17, 28. Listen carefully. When David came to the battle, his brother Eliab his oldest brother heard when he spoke to the men and Eliab anger was aroused against David and said, why did you come down here? With whom have you left those few sheep in the wilderness? Can you see the condescension here? He didn't even say a lot of sheep. Guy, you have only few sheep to take care of. Even that you could not take care of? Why did you come here? And with whom have you left those few sheep? Look at the word few sheep. In the wilderness, I know your pride and the insolence of your heart, for you have come down to see the battle. You know, he's accused of something that is not at all guilty of. He is accused of, you know, what do you call silliness. He's accused of being naughty. He's accused of being wicked. When God says this man is a man after his own heart, his brother says your heart is not right. Your heart is full of pride. And then his brother says, you know what? You couldn't even take care of your sheep. But if you look in the Bible, it says David had given the responsibility of the sheep to somebody else. And he did not come because he wanted to see the battle. He came because his father wanted to help and bless his brothers. He came to take care of their welfare. He came to feed them. But now he's accused by his own family members. You know, this is where we lose the battle. Let me tell you, we, what's the word that we use in English? We, we lose the fight, but we win the battle, right? But many a times it's the opposite. When we have somebody come and accuse us, instead of focusing on the big prize battle, we tend to focus on the little problem and the pity problem around us. Amen. Can I get the amen here? God's plan for this man is to defeat Goliath for the sake of the nation. But now if he gets entangled and have an arm wrestling and you know, mud slinging match with his brother, let me tell you, he's going to lose the battle. And the Lord told me today, many of you are being tied and entangled in things that you're not supposed to. Let me tell you, God's plan for you is not to fight with your brother or with the people that accused you. It's a greater fighter for the sake of the kingdom. Can somebody shout a hallelujah in the house of the Lord? Hey. Get ready, get ready, get ready. Can I hear somebody who knows what I'm trying? This is our leadership training material. You know, there was a time in the church where every week we had problems. Every week we had problems. Somebody will have some problems. But one day I remember the Lord told me very clearly, Anison, I'm taking you out from being a pastor is problem oriented. And I'm going to make you a growth oriented pastor. Your life journey is not to solve the little. Every day, some family will have some problem. Some people have, might have problem against you. They may not like your preaching. But your journey, your focus is not to get into a fight with those people. Whether they like it or not, you are called for a greater purpose. Can I get a shout of hallelujah in the house of the Lord? How many of you want to say, I don't want to get into this silly fight. I want to see a revival. I want to see a move of God. I want to see the kingdom of God. 
don't know how many of you understand that. You know, how many of you know many times it, when you're on the verge of the greatest move of God, there will be all kinds of irritation rain. Your wife will turn against you. Your husband will say words about you. Your children are acting up. You know what's the enemy's plan? He wants to provoke your ego and somehow get into a fight with your brother, with your wife, with your husband, so that you will lose focus on the big move of God. But today, how many of you want to say, you know what David did? You know, David, the Bible says, you know, verse number 29, and David said, what have I now done? Is there not a cause? Next to word. And then he turned from him. The best way you can do or you can deal with it, move, turn away from it. Can somebody tell the devil today, you know, my victory is going to be greater. My destiny is going to be greater. And I'm not going to get caught up, bogged down in some stupid fight with somebody for the sake of my ego. I have a greater plan. God has a greater plan for my life. Can I shout it? Come on. Hey. I want to hear some people with destiny today. Destiny. How many of you have felt that in the last few days you're getting irritated a lot? Come on. People are irritating you. Don't look at anybody enough. <laughs> Silly things. Text messages are irritating you. The people that you're working with are irritating you. You know what the devil's plan is? He wants to bog you down in that little problem so that you will lose focus on Goliath. And today, let me tell you, you have a destiny. You have a greater destiny. Your victory is a national victory. Your victory is a great victory. And how many of you want to say, I'm not going to lose focus on the stupid, silly things. I'm going to walk forward and see a greater victory for the kingdom of God. If you believe that, shout a hallelujah. Hey. You know, I've seen this in my own life. I've told this before. There was a time in my life, all hell will break loose on Sunday. Even my suit will start to act up. Everything gets, you know, you know, falls apart on a Sunday. There's a time my little children, they used to act up all through the week. They are fine, but Sunday, they start to act up. You know, I used to get so mad in the car, you know, try to control these wild kids in the car. They're not here today. It was so bad. You know, I'm driving with one hand, and I'm... Through the rear mirror, sit down. And my daughter refuses to sit on the car seat. She hates car seat. And she hated red lights. <laughs> Traffic lights she hated. The moment the car would come to a standstill, she would scream, such a scream. And then I would look at Jerry and she's sitting there as if she has gone to heaven. <laughs> That made me even more angrier. Hallelujah. What is mama doing? It's time for her to take care of. I'm supposed to go and preach on the platform. And she's sitting there. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. And I tell you, I got mad. And I remember I'll come here. And as I walked here, you know, suddenly you have to put on the face of a pastor. <laughs> a smile on your face. And you say, how oh, great thou art. Come on, hallelujah. Inside, my heart is still not connected. It is still, you know, seeming with anger. Let me tell you, when we go back home, I tell my kids, come back home. <laughs> come back home. You are going to have something from daddy when you get back home. I used to be so angry, but one day the Lord told me, son, you take care of my business. I will take care of your business. Hallelujah. Do not let anything hijack your praise, your worship. Let me make this. How many of you want to say, no matter what happens, I'm going to give God my best praise. I'm going to give the Lord my best shout of hallelujah. Can somebody give the Lord a praise? Hey. Oh, come on. Can I get somebody to move here? The devil had bogged you down with little problems, little problems in order to keep you away from the glorious victory that God was about to give you. But today you're going to say, devil, you stay here. I will deal with you later. But now I've got a Goliath to deal with. Come on, somebody shout a hallelujah. My God has a ministry for me, an anointing for my life. You know, some of you need to be very smart in order to ignore some issues on Sunday. 
or another day. And let me tell you, today we have no problem. You know, God turned things around. You know what? The person who gets all my things in order and, and, and prepares his father for the ministry almost one hour before the meeting is my son. He carries everything that I need. My bag is packed by him. My shoe is shined by him. And he will stand at the door waiting for his father to come. Let me tell you, you serve the Lord. The Lord will do the rest. <sighs> Can I get a sound of amen in this house today who is willing to say, I will not let the devil bog me down in things that are insignificant because I know I've got a destiny, I've got a ministry, and I'm going to focus on that. If you believe that, can you give a praise that's going to make the devil go nervous? Come on, give a Lord a shout of praise in the house. You have a future. Hey, come on. Can you imagine? Can I give a prophetic word here? God is putting a key in front of you. I'm giving an anointing to prophesy. I'm giving you an anointing to heal the sick. And you are now my wife. <laughs> the little problem in my house. God says, silly guy, I've got something bigger for you. Which will touch the nation. Which will release an entire generation. While you are focusing on this little irritation and distraction, how many of you want to say today, no matter whether my brother, sister, uncle, auntie, nobody can stop me from my price, from my focus, from my blessing. If you believe that, can you give a Lord the greatest praise in the house tonight? Come on, hey, this is a day of people who will not give up. Hey. Come on, hallelujah. We will not give up. We will not give up. We have a destiny. We have a future. And we are not going to get lost in these little things. Little things. God will take care of it. Come on, God will take care of it. Amen. Christian, pat yourself on your back. God is doing something for you, young man. Amen. Don't get lost in the little things. God has bigger plans. Amen. Hello, the young brother there. Can you wave there, the last brother? Yes. Don't get, your life was stolen by the devil. Because little things, family problems, separation, all that came and took your focus away from God. You were marching into a destiny and something happened. For days you went into depression. You didn't even want to live anymore. But God says today, today is bringing you back with a message. God has a destiny for your life. Destiny for your life. Can somebody put your hands together? Give a Lord a praise in the house of a Lord. God has a future. God has a destiny. Do not get Oh, somebody shout hallelujah. Yes, finance is not going to bog you down. Children are not going to bog you down. You are going to come out of it. Move, turn aside and walk, 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 walk. Because you are not going to get lost there. Come on, somebody make an action. Walk to your destiny. Walk to your destiny. There's a huge prize for your future. Don't you dare lose that with little things. Little things. Can you tell somebody, the devil is not going to irritate me. Even if he does, I'm not going to get, you know, what preoccupied with his taunting. I have only one desire. This nation has to be set free. I want to stand here and declare Pastor Anderson has only one desire to see a revival in the land of Edmonton, in the land of Canada. We want to see Jesus lifted up. Come on, somebody shout. Hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. Can I get an agreement in the house of the Lord? We want to see Jesus lifted up in this place. We want to see a revival. Yeah. Hallelujah, hallelujah. How many of you want to say the devil was attract, attracting me into this pit, pit of insignificance or insignificant things, irrelevant things? But today, I'm no more going to get gravitated towards that. I'm going to focus. My worship team is here. My, my elders are here. My you know, minister team are here. 
let me make this very clear. Not once Pastor Anderson has fought for something that is personal. I have not fought for my salary. I have not fought for my money, of my increase of, my, of, of a salary. I have never. Let me to the only thing I have stood. I want to see a move of God. I want to see the Holy Spirit move. Let me tell you, that's my desire. Can I hear somebody who wants to join and say, we want to see Canada touched by the fire of the Holy Spirit. If you believe that, can you give a Lord a shout of praise in the house of the Lord? We... Come on, hallelujah. And God, anytime I have a need, God would raise up somebody to speak on my behalf. That is God's business. But my business, let me tell you, when I left the White Avenue Church, I remember the words that I said to the board. I said, we will not compromise on our vision. Even if you have to worship under a tree, we will stand for what God has called us. And I didn't know how we were going to worship under a tree in, 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 when there's snow. <laughs> but I just said it. But God didn't take us to under a tree. He brought us into a bigger building. Amen. And we are going from here to greater glory. Greater glory in the name of Jesus. Can somebody look at me and shout an agreement, amen, in the house of the Lord. Do not get bogged down in things that are irrelevant. Number three, number three. And if I can say all that, battle of common sense. You know, King Saul had a conversation with David. And then he said, young man, you're smart, you're good, you're young, you're, you're really fiery, I can understand all that. But don't you think that man, he is being training for this. He's much more experienced. And you can't do it. You can't do this. Let me tell you, one of the greatest problems that we have, when we are moving in faith with the Spirit of God upon us, the devil will throw something called common sense. I'm not against common sense. You know, when common sense many a times makes sense. But when God comes into the picture, your best common sense does not make sense. The only difference between common sense and the wisdom of God is God coming into a picture. When God is in, in the equation, your common sense means much, not much. You know how David faced that battle of common sense? Two ways. One, he said to the, to the king, he said, King, I remember there was a time a lion came and a bear came. And it's not common sense that saved me. It is the power of God. If God can give me victories beyond my ability. And common sense in the past. That God is able. Amen. Is there anybody in this place who have experienced something from the Lord. Beyond your common sense. Amen. Now you didn't hear that. Is there anybody in this place who has got a testimony of something that God has done in your life beyond your common sense? If you know that, can you shout a hallelujah and can say, this God will give me a victory in the future. Even though it might not fit my common sense, my God is able. My God can do it. He's beyond the common sense. Come on, hallelujah. He's a God who can do all things. Can I get a shout of hallelujah? Let me tell you, common sense cannot give us a building. Common sense cannot give us a revival. Common sense cannot give us a growth here. Everything that I am standing here and proclaiming do not fit the common sense kind of a situation. But let me tell you, beyond the common sense, I believe there's a God who can do all things. Oh, come on. Common sense says I can preach more effectively in India than in Canada. But today I declare my God is beyond the common sense. He can send a revival in this place. And I believe it with all of my heart. Can I get somebody to believe with me? He's a God. Amen. Some of your miracles cannot be subjected to common sense. Yes, it makes sense. Because it's the most wise words that you're getting from somebody who's a king. You're young. You don't have experience. That guy is too experienced. 
In the light of your problem, your challenge, you don't have it. Let me tell you, some of you have been bound by the spirit of common sense or the devil under the garb of common sense has held you captive. But today, you're going to declare what no humans can do. What is impossible with man is possible with my God. So let me ask you once again, is there anybody in this place who can testify? I've had the move of God in my life in the past, which was not based on common sense, beyond common sense. God has done things in my life. Only such people can you make an agreement in the house of the Lord today. And God says, oh, come on, lift up your voice, lift up your voice. If you have experienced a miracle, if you have experienced a salvation, if you have experienced something from God that cannot be explained by common sense, give the Lord a praise in the house of the Lord and declare Refuse to put the armor of common sense on you because God has a greater plan. Number four, I don't have time. Let me say this. Number four, direct battle of the enemy. When the enemy is direct, be direct. The enemy looked at David and said, I will kill you today. I will destroy you today. And I will give before this evening is over your body, your flesh to the fowl of the air and the beast of the ground. And David countered it and said, it is not me who's going to die, it's you. And the Lord told me, when you enter the direct battle, and some of you are there, do not mince words. Do not be polite with the devil. Yes. Say it as it is. Say, God is going to give me victory. Yes. Come on. Somebody needs to address the devil on that particular area that he's attacking you. Say, my God will give me victory. Come on, be direct. Be direct. Do not use indirect words. Do not be in, in, a, in a formal with the devil. Tell him on his face, today the Lord is going to give me victory in the name of Jesus. You know what I'm going to do today? After go even on the plane, I want to mark the things that the devil has said impossible in my life. And I'm going to touch every one of them. And I'm going to reverse it today. You said it is impossible. But I declare it is possible. Amen. You said it's not going to happen. I declare it's going to happen. Amen. How many of you want to start a direct battle? Come on. This is a direct battle. If the devil is against your health, attack him back. Attack him. This is not defensive battle. This is an offensive battle. Open your mouth and say, greater is my God. Greater is going to be my victory. Can I get somebody who can believe? faith in the house of the Lord how many of you want to say I will see the move of God I will see my come on get ready get ready get ready get ready get ready don't use you know maybe one day if it is God's will you know Goliath just say it directly before this day is over I'm going to get my victory devil in the name of Jesus you are lost I have won. I have the victory. In the name of Yeshua, I have the victory. So can I hear the voice of people who are not under the, in the camp of King Saul, lost the anointing, but if the anointing is fresh on you, remove yourself in the camp of David and say, God has given me victory. God has given my family victory. Come on, put your hands together. Give the Lord a shout of praise in the house of the Lord. You are not in the camp of King Saul. You are in the camp of David. You are in the camp of the anointed. You are in the camp of those who believe the Holy Spirit can do all things. Let's pray. Let's pray. I have to go one more point, but I want to start in entering into a time of prayer. I want to declare today, how many of you want to say, yes, you know, King Saul is contemplating for 40 days. He is sitting there and, 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 and trying to reflect and introspect and plan and, and sit there and contemplate. But today we need somebody who will stop contemplating and declare in the name of Jesus. Come on, somebody who will open their mouth and say, my family will be set free. My children are going to be set free. My nation is going to be set free. Can I hear the voice of people? People who want to attack the devil directly today in the name of 
get ready get ready get ready get ready get ready something mighty is happening in the name of Jesus the devil says I will destroy your family tell the devil no weapon formed against me shall prosper oh the devil says I will destroy your health tell the devil God has given me health oh, my family is healthy my future is healthy in the name of Jesus come on declare it declare it he is Jehovah Rapha my healer the devil says I will remove rest from your life and I will make your life a life of intense fights and restlessness tell the devil God is my Jehovah Shalom my peace can you declare it the devil is looking at somebody and say I will put you to shame tell the devil those who looked on the face of God and never put to shame their face were radiant somebody enough of sitting there and thinking and planning and contemplating and wondering speculating articulating as to why these things happen in your life it's time to stand up and say enough is enough come on oh I'm giving some people a few seconds is anybody willing to say I will not let the stalemate continue forever the stalemate is going to be broken somebody has to break it somebody has to break it somebody has to break the stalemate receive it in the name of Jesus this is a prophecy over somebody break the stalemate break oh I can sense the power of God upon people right now break the stalemate of your destiny break the stalemate of your family break the stalemate of your children in the name of Jesus Stalemate, stalemate. Get ready, get ready, get ready. Huda Rabaka Shakandaloria. The devil with his direct, direct words has created a stalemate. Oh, I see the word stalemate over your life, over your future, over your destiny, over your children, over your ministry. But today, in the name of Jesus, by opening our mouths, by declaring our victory, by pronouncing the defeat of the enemy, we are coming out of the stalemate in the name of Jesus. This church is coming out. This church is coming out. Our missions are coming out of the stalemate. If you believe that, I sense a power being released. Financial stalemate, physical stalemate, children's stalemate. Be broken today in the name of Jesus. Get ready, get ready, get ready. Get ready, get ready. Oh, Rabba Kashante. Something mighty. Those of you standing, don't sit. God says, I'm going to bring you out of the stalemate. But you have to address the devil directly. I said directly. Jesus said, look at the mountain and command the mountain to be uprooted. Today, some of you are going to open your mouth and say, you cannot touch me, devil. You cannot in hinder my family anymore. You cannot defeat my life anymore. You cannot hold our church in stalemate and our children in stalemate anymore. Can somebody who has got such an audacity of faith lift up your voice and give a Lord a shout in the house of a Lord? You are... Get ready, get ready, get ready. Get ready, something mighty is happening today in the name of Jesus. No more stalemate. No more stalemate. Today, do you remember Jesus Christ, the son of David? He came and declared today, today the bondages are going to be broken. Somebody take the anointing of the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords upon your life. You don't belong to King Saul. You belong to the Davidic. <laughs> anointing. Today. 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 Today, in the name of Jesus, my family is coming out, my children are coming out, healings are taking place. Today, in the name of Jesus, hallelujah. Stalemate 
is broken. Stalemate is broken. Is anybody, anybody in this place, in spite of the fact that you have made progress, you still feel that you are in a stalemate. No move is happening. Everything remains where it was. The status quo is painfully maintained. Somehow you're surviving. But are you ready to say, it's going to be broken? 40 days, the devil put Israel under a stalemate. But one man, believing God, who knows the power of God, declare the stalemate is over. Come on, somebody, lift up your voice and say the stalemate of my family is over. If you believe that, can we give a Lord the best shout and clap offering in the house of a Lord? Give a Lord a clap offering. Give the Lord a clap offering. The stalemate is over. The fifth, I don't want to preach on that, but I want to say a word and they're done. Battle of pride and self-glory. Meaning, after you've got your victory, do not, get, do not fall into this pride. Give the Lord the glory. But I want to speak a word today. And with this, we are going to pray. I'm here to announce, because this came in a dream. I'm here to announce the stalemate of your spiritual life. Of your family. Of your generation. Is now terminated by the power of a living God who is God above every other gods. If you believe that, can I hear the sound of somebody who wants to release the stalemate broken in the house of a Lord? Can somebody give a Lord a praise release? Hey! In the name of Jesus. I don't know if you know this God. This God is above the gods of the Philistines. This God is above every giant that came against your life. This God is God above every suppression that almost put you into a place of stalemate. But today, the impasse is over. The impasse is over. The stalemate is over. The stagnation, stagnation is over. You are coming out in the name of Jesus. The nation is coming out. The city is coming out. Get ready, get ready, get ready. But I want somebody to receive this because this is all based not on your power, not on your strength, not on your church, not on your ability, not on your experience. It is based only on one thing. Can we read that? First Samuel chapter 17 and verse number 45 onwards. And I heard, I kept on hearing the word today and I know that will seal the deal. Then David said to the Philistine, you come to me with a sword, with a spear and with a javelin. But I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel. I heard a voice today. Today when you stand up and praise God, the army of God is about to line up in this place. The angels of God are going to move in this place today. Get ready, get ready, get ready, get ready. The God of the armies of Israel. Hey. Hey. Is there anybody that believes that you're not alone. Come on, you are not alone. There is angelic armies around you right now. But the Lord says, until you move, the armies will not move. Are you ready to move in the name of Jesus? Let the armies of God take command. Take their position. Whom you have defied. This man was not attacking you. He was attacking your God. The problem that came against you was not about you. It was about your God. The attack that came against your children was not about you. It was about your God. And tonight the battle is not between you and the giant. It is between your God and the gods of the Philistines. Are you ready to release the power of God in the city right now? Are you ready? The next word. This is what the Lord told me and I'm going to declare it. This day... Be direct. Can you, when you say, don't say, God, do something. Say, on this situation, on this day, there will be a move of God. Be specific. And I will strike you and take your head from you. 
And this day, I will give you carcasses of the camp. Then all this assembly shall know that the Lord does not save with sword and spear, for the battle is the Lord's, and he'll give you into our hands. The next word. And he said, everybody will know. You know, it says here that the whole earth may know that there is a God in Israel. And the Lord told me, your victory is connected to the glory of your God. On the count of three, I'm going to ask you to stand up or move or do whatever you want. How many of you want to say, God, this victory, when that happens, people will know. I have only one desire. People should know there's a God. There's a God in Edmonton. There's a God in Israel. Only those who want to lift up the name of your God, who want your life to be a promotion of his glory, can you make some agreement in the house of the Lord when this miracle will happen, when this healing will happen, people will know that there's a God. How many of you want your God to be glorified? There's a God who's above every other gods. There's a God who can do miracles. There's a God who can do healings. There's a God who can restore my families. There's a God who can transform the lives of people. There's a God who can save the sinners. There's a God who can heal cancer. There's a God who can do miracles. Let the city know that there is a God in Israel. Can somebody become the ambassador of that God? Can somebody become the voice of that God in the house of the Lord today? It's not about your glory. It's not the glory of your church. It's the glory of God. It's the glory of the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. I told the Lord, it's not about Zion. Let the city know that there is a God. The devil is defying that God. This stalemate is, is, is pouring torrents of abuse. Not just against you, but against your God. Do you know Israel? They come in the morning and in the evening and say that prayer, the Shema prayer. Hear, O Israel, that your God, thy Lord is one. In the morning and the evening, many Jewish rabbis believe it is the same time in the morning and the evening that Goliath would come and speak against the God of Israel. Every time you prayed, He spoke against your God. But God says, I'm going to prove that I'm God. How many of you want not your glory? When the victory happens, it's the glory of your God. Come on, can I get a witness here? When that victory will happen, your relatives, your family members, and the people around you will know there's a God in Israel. There's a God who can do all things. Can I get a shout of agreement in the house of the Lord? How many of you want to say, it's not for my glory, for his glory, for his glory. I'm going to do two things today. Number one, open your mouth and bring down the giant. Bring down that giant that caused stalemate upon your life. Everything in your life is in an impasse. It's bound today and you're just going through a motion. But today in the name of Jesus Christ, you are being released. Your family is going to be released. Are you ready to shout the name of Jesus and get your victory? On the count of three, let's do it. One, two, and three. Come on, stale made broken, stale made broken in the name of Jesus. Speak, 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 declare in the name of Jesus that your family is coming out, your children are coming out. Speak it out, speak it out, don't stop. People have been held in fear, they're coming out. 
People are held by suppression. They're coming out. People have been held by the power of Goliath. They're coming out in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Can I ask everybody to raise your hand right now? Raise your hand. Father, representing this church and the people over whom the devil has a stranglehold, holding back their destiny and putting it into confinement of limitation. I decree right now, I declare right now, this place and these families are coming out. It's broken. 40 days is broken. The devil's hold is broken. Thank you, Lord. It's been done in the name of Jesus Christ. In the name above all other names, I declare families be set free right now in the name of Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. It's been done. And those of you believe and those of you want, every victory that you get, it is not to make you big, not to make your name great. God will do that when the time would come. But you don't have to do that. It is to lift the name of your God. It's for the glory of the name of Jesus. If you are happy for Jesus getting the glory in this city, in your situation, can you give a glorifying praise to the Lord right now in the name?